and welcome to this evening's event, hosted by the University of Bath Institute for Policy Research. Thank you for joining us online for the next event in our series on the oceans. My name is Philippe Blondel. I'm a senior lecturer at the university, a deputy director of the Center for Space, Atmospheric and Ocean Science. Our Oceans, a deep dive is our new free public event series scheduled to take place throughout this academic year. With public lectures, panel debates, this event series will engage with experts, advisors, policymakers, and the public to address the very important role our oceans play in our collective action to reach net zero, how we can protect indigenous communities and our oceans from pollution, other fishing and fish farming, the role of opportunities of nature-based and geoengineering solutions and the geopolitics of the oceans. This evening, we are delighted to welcome Professor Peter Wadhams online to give us a lecture. Peter is Professor of Ocean Physics and the head of the Polar Ocean Physics Group in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. He is the UK's most experienced CI scientist with 40 years of research in sea ice and ocean processes in the Arctic and the Antarctic. He is the author of numerous publications on the dynamics, thermodynamics of sea ice, thickness of ice, waves in ice, icebergs, ocean convections, and kindred topics. I have one of his books there on my shelf, and I use that for every student project I do on the Arctic, because it is the reference that people should read. Peter has led 46 research expeditions to the polar seas, working from ice camps, icebreakers, aircraft. In the field, he's worked extensively with submarines, where he used sonar to measure the ice topography and carried out six voyages to the North Pole from 1971 to 2007. Following his lecture, we'll hear from Dr. Jun Zhang. Dr. Jun Zhang is a reader and the Deputy Director of the Center for Infrastructure, Geotechnics, Geotechnics and Water Engineering, IGWE, in the Department of Architecture and Civil Engineering at the University of Bath. She is leading one of the world groups on investigating violent wave impact on coastal and offshore structures, developing marine renewable energy, advanced numerical methods for accurate modeling of coastal and urban flooding, and wave structure interaction. Once we've heard from both speakers, we'll then open it up to you at home for questions and discussion. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you're on social media, please do use the hashtag hash IPR oceans or tag us at Uni of Bath IPR. Please note that your cameras and microphones will remain switched off. If you have a question, please submit your question via the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will aim to respond to all questions toward the end of today's session. This session is being recorded, so filming and photography is taking place. Subject to no technical difficulties, the session will be available online as a podcast and video at a later date. Thank you all for joining us, and I'm very pleased now to pass over to Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe, and uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to speak here in Bath. Um, the topic um, is oceans and geoengineering, so that's really a, a wide collection of, of topics concerned with how um, we, we use geoengineering methods to try to uh, either uh, reduce the, the, the amount of warming that the world is subject to or actively uh, get rid of carbon dioxide. Um, so these are methods that are connected with the sea as opposed to methods that purely use the air. Um, so we'll start off um, we'll start off by uh, getting to my slides. If, I can, here we go. Um, uh, 
Right, well, I've started right at the end here, so I'll... Uh, so, I have to go right back to start again. Um, here we are. Um, right, well, first of all, <laughs> Philippe mentioned, was kind enough to mention one of my books, and I, uh, like all academics, I advertise by our wares, and uh, this is a more recent book about climate change in, in the uh, Arctic and, and how that affects climate change throughout the world, and it's called A Farewell to Ice, I stole the title from Hemingway, and there's another um, very nice educational facility Called Ice, a film called Ice on Fire, which has come out a year or two back, um, made by Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's got, uh, it deals very um, intensely with various geoengineering methods and air capture methods for um, reducing global warming. And uh, they, they, at great expense, flew around the world and visited all the sites where these things are going on. And uh, so I, I'm in that one, but as well. But uh, um, it focuses on uh, events around the world concerned with climate change um, removal. And one of them is all the work that's being done in Orkney at the moment on on, uh, on, on getting rid of CO2. So that, that's a nice uh, film, if you can get to see it. Uh, the, the, uh, the film maker is, keeps it hidden away, but there's a pirated edition that you can see online. And of course, the other inspiration I want to acknowledge here is of course Greta Thunberg, who's just brought so much energy and to, to this question of, of climate change removal. And, um, I've just come back from the COP26 meeting where she was very vigorous in trying to, to get the, uh, the older generation to do something, um, possibly unsuccessful, unfortunately, but we'll see. Peter, sorry to interrupt, uh, several uh, members of the audience have asked if you can put the, screens, uh, the slides on full screen in oh, presentation yeah. or slideshow mode because that will uh, translate better on their own screens. Oh, certainly, yes, okay. I thought I'd done that, there we go. Okay, there we Perfect. go. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> if you can read all this, uh, this is just meant to illustrate uh, the history of, of, of our mankind's involvement with what's brought about the, this terrible state of the climate, and that's emission of fossil fuels, and we, use of fossil fuels to emit um, uh, carbon dioxide. And um, when all this started, it was in the early 19th century when, when steam became, uh, steam engines were developed and coal became the main fuel. And um, for many years, people had no idea that we were doing anything to the climate um, by burning coal. And in fact, it was only in 1896 that the, the relationship between carbon dioxide production and uh, climate was, was found quantitatively, and that was uh, Professor Svantarinius in Sweden wrote this classic paper uh, about the role of carbon carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground. So from 1896, we had no excuse for ignoring climate change produced by burning fossil fuels, but of course we did ignore it. But the, the most sacred um, uh, element that, that's telling us what's going on is of course the, the historic data set going back to 1958 that was recorded on the top of Mauna Loa uh, the volcano in Hawaii. Um, this was started by Keeling of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and it really is the, the truth about the climate. And when you, when you refer to all the um, 
various uh, untruths put about by politicians and so on, you have to keep going back to this curve because this is actually how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere and, and warm, global warming is linearly related really to carbon dioxide content. So the, what this is showing us is that carbon dioxide content continues to increase exponentially. At the end of the ice age, it was 280 parts per million, and um, it had only risen to 320 when the measurement started uh, in Hawaii. But of course, it's shot up since then, and it's now way beyond 400. And here it is again with a couple of, of measurements done on dates exactly a year apart. And we see that on average, the uh, CO2 content in the atmosphere is rising at about three parts per million per year, uh, which is a very high rate of increase. And of course, the rate of increase is itself increasing. To get a feel for how useless our own response has been, we have here the dates of the 26 COP meetings organized as uh, the, the, the Partner, par parties meet, the meeting of the parties involved in the UN uh, Committee on Climate Change. And we see red, the, the red circles are specific dates that should have made a change in everything. That's the date of the Rio summit, the Kyoto Accord, the Copenhagen Accord, and the Paris Agreement is the last but one. And the very last one is last year's COP meeting that was going to be in Chile, but was held in Madrid. But we see that um, none of those meetings or none of those agreements have had the slightest impact on the rate of growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we, we see these sets of tangents to the curve getting steeper and steeper. And here's a few specific events. Again, none of them had any impact on the curve. Uh, so we really have a, a job to do in the world, which is to, for scientists and politicians to be credible in saying that we've had it. If we're not careful, the climate change is becoming extreme. We have to do something, but we simply don't do it. Well, let's look at some of the things we don't do. One of them is uh, that carbon dioxide is, of course, the, the main villain here, but methane is catching it up. And uh, like, like me, carbon dioxide, methane shot up in the 19th century because of burning of fossil fuels. Um, but unlike carbon dioxide, which has continued to increase exponentially, methane seemed to reach a peak in the first years of this century. And it was thought, well, somehow or other, for some unknown reason, methane is, has been beaten and it's not rising anymore. Unfortunately, that's, that turned out not to be the case. Uh, the first evidence came from uh, methane detectors in the Arctic. And um, he, the, here it looks like a poor quality curve, but in fact, those little dots are real data and what it is, is, is methane bursts coming from various sources of methane in the Arctic, wafting over the methane collector. And um, uh, a, fame, a well known Arctic uh, glaciologist called this dragon's breath because methane is, of course, burns. And it's little, it's like little coughs of methane being emitted by source natural or artificial sources and of course when you put all that lot together you find that methane having reached a peak and seemingly stopped rising has started started to rise again very rapidly so methane is now uh, participating in the the climate change race and uh, in fact it's rising at a greater rate than carbon dioxide so what, what, who are the villains here emitting most of this? Well, sadly, at the moment, 
is China and India are the two biggest emitters. And uh, with Europe and the USA uh, apparently having beaten uh, methane, be be beaten carbon dioxide to some extent and reduced their emissions. But we can see that that's only because we transferred most of our industry to China and India and it's their dirty factories that have taken the place of our dirty factories and the total for the world is continuing to rise at an ever increasing rate. We, we know that this is something we have to do something about it and it's something which has been linearly, it's been increasing for every month of the year and uh, this was a rather clever graph produced to show um, for every month of the year, from January down to December, um, the ranking of temperature um, so that the, the, hot, the, the, reddest, the reddest years are the, the hottest years for that month of the year. So we find without, to, to our non-surprise, that the, uh, the hottest uh, years have been the most recent ones. The coldest years have been the oldest ones going back, we're only going back 40 years, uh, but the, the present day years are the ones that are responsible for the highest temperatures of all. So what can we do about this? Um, we can reduce our carbon emissions. This is the universal um, solution recommended by IPCC and uh, most, most people would say well how do we beat climate change? We reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, if possible we reduce our carbon emissions to zero although I don't see how that's feasible. But in fact of course what people forget is that carbon stays in the carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere virtually forever, certainly for hundreds of years. So that if, if we reduce our carbon emissions, we're still warming the climate. We're still adding carbon to the climate, uh, to, the, to the atmosphere, and that's causing the, the, the temperature to rise. We're never going to bring the temperature down, bring ourselves to a more moderate climate by reducing our emissions. We can reduce them as much as we like, but it won't do us any good in the end. We have to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in some way uh, or find some way that reduces the amount of radiation that the world, that the earth uh, is putting out. So we, we, we can switch to renewable energy, but we, it doesn't actually solve the problem for us. This is something that needs, still needs to be, to be beaten home and in, in COP 26, it was still something that wasn't universally understood. So it's extraordinary, but there we are. Um, so let's look at the ways involving the ocean that can be used to try to reduce this rate of warming and try to bring it down to, to uh, negative warming. And um, the first method I'm going to talk about is marine cloud brightening. Uh, this is this does not involve directly in removing carbon dioxide from the air, but uh, rather um, reducing uh, or increasing rather the amount of radiation being emitted, long long wave radiation being emitted by the planet, so that we don't warm up so fast. In fact, we don't warm up at all. So th th this this method was discovered really by. Uh, Toomey, uh, a few in 1990, and then was developed as a method by John Latham at Leeds, and then further by Stephen Salter in Edinburgh and uh, Alan Guardian in Leeds. So what, what you do is you, you take marine stratocumulus clouds, that's uh, the, the sort of low level miserable gray clouds that we see uh, a lot in Britain, and you, um, you in, add uh, a, a, ray, a strain of, of very tiny droplets of, in fact, of seawater um, to 
brighten the clouds they, they're at a certain size which is uh, one or two nanometers across the the droplets actually increase the brightness of the cloud and the bright the bright the brightened cloud that spreads around the world uh, then increases the albedo the average albedo of the planet increases the emissions from the surface and uh, cools the planet down so you're, we're looking at one micrometer seawater droplets and they have to be injected into the cloud base and they form these cloud droplets. So the inspiration for this came from this very interesting uh, picture, which, which at first sight is, is quite incredible. Uh, I think I've got it. Yes, I've got it again in a different projection. And these are contrails, but they're contrails of ships, funnels, exhausts, looking up. They look like aircraft contrails, but they're ship contrails. And we're looking at a quite a, uh, a large area here. We're looking at this is Spain, and this is Brittany, and uh, west, western part of Britain is over here. So we're looking at ships' tracks, uh, and we're looking at tracks which take a ship at least two days to, to do. You'll be going from Britain across the Bay of Biscay. And so the, the ship is leaving uh, an exhaust of, of uh, uh, water vapour in the atmosphere. And amazingly, this is surviving for a couple of days. You expect it to disappear virtually immediately, but it doesn't. Uh, so here we see ship's contrails and uh, what we're looking at is, is the water vapour that, that the ship's uh, funnel is emitting. So this stuff is, is actually very interesting. The material, and um, to me who discovered that if, if we added a, a, a lot more aerosol particles to clouds, it makes them brighter. Um, Took, gave this idea to Latham, uh, Latham who unfortunately recently died, and um, the idea then is to, to take identical clouds, take a cloud, and but fill it with, with lower, with smaller sized particles, smaller droplets. And here we see the difference, that the, this is the Toomey effect. Here's two, two bottles full of glass balls, uh, one with diameters of four meters, four millimeters, and one of 40 microns. And we see the difference. One looks brighter than the other. And that's a simple, simple viewing of the Toomey effect. So the idea is to, uh, this, which was developed by Stephen Salter, uh, as, uh, who's a brilliant engineer, uh, is to have a ship, an unmanned ship, which looks something like this, um, I'll show, in fact, his early version, which looks easier to understand. And in this early version, you have a, uh, a drone ship. You have, uh, these are Flettner rotors. These are rotating cylinders, which uh, develop a thrust because of the, the Magnus effect. So it's equivalent to having three sails, uh, except the, the cylinders are being rotated. And up in the middle of the cylinders goes uh, the pipe uh, you pump seawater up to the top, pass through a very fine nozzle and inject the, the tiny particles, the micrometer part, particles into the cloud. And you need about uh, 200 of these, according to Stephen, um, to, to get enough effect to alter the, the world's climate. Uh, 40 of them would be enough to affect the climate of the Arctic and restore uh, cold conditions to the Arctic. Um, this was his early design. His later designs um, actually have these little um, uh, uh, these little hydrofoils, and the the water is not sprayed up into the cloud; it's sprayed sideways. For some reason, this seems to work better. So here, is, here again is his, one of his new designs. Of course, 
what would be nice if somebody would fund him to actually make these and get them going. But sadly, in, in our country, there hasn't been the support which he needs to actually get uh, a viable global system or even national system of marine cloud brightening going. We desperately need this. Um, another, another method that has been tried has been injecting uh, aerosols into the stratosphere. So this is uh, the principle of that. You simply find a means to loft um, uh, a powdered aerosol into the high stratosphere and you then release it. This is, can be from a balloon or from a rocket. And uh, it spreads out and uh, reflects solar radiation and gradually settles out. Now this has actually been physically tried, but um, there are a number of problems with it. One of them is public perception, because you're, you're covering the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere with something which you would regard as a poison. It's some kind of powder, uh, which is to the public would seem dubious, even though it's tiny quantities, whereas, with marine cloud brightening, we're dealing with seawater, which is pretty safe. And uh, the other thing is you have to wait while this aerosol settles out. And while it's settling out, which can take weeks or months, it, it's doing things to the climate. Whereas again, with uh, marine cloud brightening, um, you can turn the, the uh, injection of the, uh, of the aerosol off uh, by simply stopping pumping. So you can, if you think that you're doing something unfortunate to the atmosphere, if you if it looks as if you might be altering something like the the uh, the monsoon, you simply stop pumping and everything stops. So you you don't have to cope with um, a situation which you're helpless to affect, which is what you get with stratospheric aerosols. So. Certainly, I mean, personally, I would go for um, marine cloud brightening here, and uh, I think a lot of other people would too, um, in terms of the, 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 the threat that's posed by powdered aerosols in, in the upper atmosphere. Anyway, we do have an agreement um, in place. It's one of those agreements which has had no impact on, on uh, uh, the, the uh, level of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, but the, the Paris Agreement of 2015 uh, says that we will try to hold global temperature rise to below 2 degrees and even to try to get it to 1.5 degrees without saying how on earth we're going to do that. Um, we, uh, we want to um, match temperature emissions to sinks so that we get we can get down to net zero emissions and there's been a lot of discussion about what net zero means uh, because many people think it's a kind of fraud that you emit your your greenhouse gas and you find compensating uh, ways of, of getting rid of it somewhere else but you have to believe that those are being enacted and uh, there's a lot of, in, in COP, there was a lot of uh, concern that, that net zero doesn't mean zero. And every five years, parties should be updating. They should be offering to make a contribution that will be enough to bring the, the temperature rise down to two degrees. Um, and if that, if the, if the, the voluntary, um, emission reduction, which they promise isn't enough, then they'll be asked to reduce their emissions even more. And this year with COP26 was the first of those five year reviews. So this is where it was very important that uh, a significant reduction should be achieved or a significant planned reduction should be achieved. Uh, unfortunately, that, that was not achieved. <clears throat> 
Let's look at other ways, uh, various ways of getting rid of carbon dioxide. And the, the simplest one that, that looks most attractive is afforestation. You just plant um, millions of trees and a tree is a very good thing for removing carbon dioxide. So uh, trees do do good, but the trouble is they don't do, there's not, they don't do good well enough or fast enough. Um, if, for instance, we look at the emissions in Europe and the carbon dioxide emissions from, um, uh, from, our, from our artificial anthropogenic emissions, then the area that we would have to plant with trees to remove the European carbon emissions is the same as the area of Europe, 6.4 million square kilometres we would have to absolutely cover Europe with trees if we wanted to get rid of the carbon dioxide that we emit in Europe. And of course we can't do that because we have other things to do in Europe, like living and um, we can't simply have an impenetrable forest. So afforestation is not the answer. There's a, a, a second method which is not quite so bad uh, which is uh, bioenergy, you plant um, something which simply is grown uh, to, be, to be torn down and, and turned into, into, uh, into bio, biomass, and that's some kind of massively um, wasteful material. But then you combine that with carbon capture and storage. I actually don't understand why anybody would do this um, because it's a two-stage process and it still uses up quite a high fraction of the, of the land in Europe, getting on for half. The thir a third method is enhanced weathering. And we know that, for instance, silicate rocks, will, if you crush them, will slowly absorb um, carbon dioxide. And um, so the idea is you crush silicate rocks and spread them everywhere. You would have to spread them over all the beaches in the world, a lot of the roads in the world. You'd need, crushed silicate rock would, have, would be one of the most um, popular features in the whole of Europe. And, and, and yet, even so, the, the weathering is very slow, the carbon dioxide Removal is slow, and then when it when it's exhausted, you have to somehow remove all this crushed uh, silicate and put down another layer. So it, again, it's unfeasible. We are dealing a lot with unfeasible methods here um, when it comes to how do we get carbon dioxide levels down? How do we make our climate more livable? And so all those first three, I think, are not feasible. The fourth one is the one that makes the most sense, which is direct air capture. That is, if since it's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere which is causing climate change, then we can get rid of climate change by taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. This is what you would think. Um, and so I will just cover this quickly, although this is not actually geoengineering as such. Um, what we have to do, if we're going to have any method that gets rid of all the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere, then we've got to put, to take out 42 gigatons a year. This is the amount that we put in. This is a gigantic amount. We've got to find a way of get rid in, getting rid of 42 gigatons a year. So the methods that have been proposed are fairly, com they're, fa they're, they're simple, simple, physics, but what you do is take, uh, blow air through uh, a solution like sodium, can be a simple substance like sodium hydroxide, which absorbs carbon dioxide, and then the carbon dioxide then has to be purified and gotten rid of. Um, the, the, the methods of purifying it can consist purely of compressing it and putting it underground, that is the sort of European approach, or turning it into something which does something and makes money. This is the American approach, the, the making money part. 
and the, the make, making money part, the, the, the most effective method tried so far is turning it into artificial limestone. And this is done by a company called Blue Planet uh, in California, which is now opening branches in Europe and working in collaboration with the cement industry. Um, they, uh, another way is to just simply pump it underground into caverns. And Climeworks, a Swiss company, has been doing that in Iceland, where there's very large caverns sitting there waiting to receive carbon dioxide. Uh, so it's being done in the geothermal plant in southern Iceland. And then the final method, which seems slightly illogical, is to turn it into jet fuel, and then you can burn the jet fuel. Of course, you get carbon dioxide as a result, but you only get the same amount you started with. So it's a, a way of, uh, of, not in, uh, of not increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels in the aircraft. Um, and you can't really avoid at the moment burning fossil fuels in aircraft because you don't have electric aircraft that are efficient enough to become airliners. So these are the methods used. Um, this is the limestone method and here's some nodules of limestone. It works very nicely. Here's the technician showing how you can incorporate those nodules into cement uh, and make therefore a, a, a complex of concrete which is actually carbon negative. This has been used actually to re-roof one of the airline terminals in San Francisco and this is the first use of carbon negative cement. So this is a real advance. And uh, where, where I'm working at the moment, there's a small pilot plant in Apulia uh, being run by the Turin Polytechnic, which is trying to, to do something similar. But unfortunately, it, it got closed down because of the, uh, the uh, COVID. And in fact, that was one of the reasons I been spending the last year or two in Turin was to work with, with this plant, but the plant sadly has, uh, has died along with um, a lot of COVID victims. This is the a plant that's working, the one in, in Iceland. And um, the, one of the things that we notice, and this is one of the reasons why geoengineering is attractive, is the fact that Direct air capture is a very, very energy intensive business. Um, it's here you're having to use a geothermal power plant to provide the energy for the um, carbon dioxide removal. And there's a, a similar plant in Canada, which is the one that's doing the jet fuel. And that's up in the Rocky Mountains. And it's there because it uses um, hydroelectric power and this is these are the where the, the the air is blasted through the collectors so you you need a lot of energy to do this and um, that's one of the reasons why direct air capture which at first sight seemed the answer and I still think it is um, because we can we can make it more efficient um, but the, the, the amount of enthusiasm for it has start, started to diminish and people are looking at other methods, many of them involving the ocean. How, do we, how can we get our CO2 out of the ocean? Because removing CO2 from the ocean is the same as removing it from the air, really. Um, it's, it it, it re-equilibrates -equil so that it's the same as if you had actually taken it directly out of the air. So I'll just mention one other method before moving on, which is biochar. Uh, this is uh, a waste, an agricultural waste product. In this case, it's pistachio nuts, and it's, it's digested in a low oxygen environment. Um, and that produces uh, a, a, a charcoal-like material and, and also called biochar, and also a kind of um, oily fluid um, and it takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now, the, the, this has been used in one academic world place, that's California State University in Ventura, where they have a biochar plant 
uh, as an adjunct to their, their um, energy system. So it's the only university that I know of which is partly powered from pistachio nut shells. Um, but Cambridge should take note. Um, but it's still, it's too expensive still, this hydrocarbon removal by, um, by uh, air capture. And so I'm just saying who supports this at the moment? Nobody does sufficiently to actually make direct air capture the solution that we need now. Um, although there's foundations which are doing their best with limited resources. And the final thing I'll mention about, which again is concerned with, with the ocean, is the problem of methane. And, um, and especially this is associated with the, high, with the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean has about uh, a third of the area of the Arctic Ocean is very shallow shelf seas which are less than 100 meters deep. Now, as sea ice has been retreating from the, the center, from the periphery of the Arctic, leaving only sea ice in the center of the Arctic in summer, and it may disappear from there pretty soon, but around the edges of the Arctic, we have open water in summer. The open water is shallow. That means it warms up. And as it warms up, and here we can see water that's, that's risen to five degrees in summer around the, ed the edge of the Siberian seas. And when it warms up, um, a protective layer of, of, uh, of material on the seabed, uh, which, which is actually frozen ground, um, thaws and reveals something below, which is much more nasty, uh, which is methane in the form of methane hydrates, which are solid material, but quickly turn into a gas if you release the overpressure. So this has been happening more and more, and expeditions that go to the East Siberian Sea are seeing more and more of these plumes of methane coming from the seabed, reaching the surface and being emitted into the atmosphere, increasing the atmospheric methane content. Now, some, some methane, um, so-called experts have said there's no danger because the methane dissolves in the ocean uh, on the way up, but it doesn't. It, it does if the ocean's deep enough, but with only 50 or 60 meters, it doesn't. It comes out and we see it coming out. And um, so we've, we've got a problem now of potentially uh, a big outbreak of methane because the protective layer on the seabed is thawing and that's releasing more and more methane in the form of these plumes. Will it form a gigantic outbreak? We don't know. This is, this by the way, is, is what methane hydrates look like. It's, it looks like ice which burns. Well, the UK government says we shouldn't have to worry about the ice disappearing. This is somebody called Lord Bourne. Um, so um, I won't go into that except to say we should wait, we should, if the government says we shouldn't be worrying, that means we should be worrying. And we're seeing a lot of other effects going on at the same time. I'll just show some of these at the bottom. The ocean is getting more acidic because of increased carbon dioxide dissolving in it. Um, the ocean heat being absorbed is, is going to greater depths. And uh, the, the region of the hypoxic region, that's the region near the equator where you're getting very little production because uh, of the surface water being of low density, is getting to spread north and south because we're getting warmer and warmer water at the equator. So we're seeing big changes going on um, and we need a way to try to, to, um, to get rid of some of that um, if we can. Various ideas have been proposed, which, which some of which seem to make sense, but haven't been tried properly yet. One of them is buoyant flakes. Rice flakes are, this thing on the left is a mountain of rice flakes, and rice being a staple diet, um, the waste from it 
is gigantic, it's mountains load of, of, of rice flakes. And it turns out that rice flakes are buoyant. And um, if you um, add, coat them in a kind of mud that comes from aluminium refining, then they become iron rich. And when these iron rich flakes float around in the ocean and react with methane, because methane reacts with ferric chloride um, and disappears as methane. So a way of getting rid of methane from the ocean surface is to spread huge amounts of buoyant rice flakes on the surface. It sounds crazy, but actually it makes sense. Um, so this is something worth trying. There are lots of other methods to try to, to, uh, to recover the, the colder climate that we want. And I don't believe in any of them. Um, they're concerned with ice cap thickening. And um, the, they, they relate to um, wind turbines being used to pump seawater up onto the top of existing ice flows to make the ice flows grow thicker. Now this has been used for small areas um, in the case of trying to uh, make pads for oil drilling. But the large areas, the millions of square kilometers needed for just the Arctic Ocean, let alone the, anywhere else, is I think uh, just unfeasible. We have to always think of scaling up when, whenever we're planning some wonderful technique for uh, dealing with climate, we have to scale it up and see how we can do it. One of the latest ideas is mirrors. Um, and it started out as being floating mirrors, which I think is unfeasible. But mirrors on land may work, but you have to work out how much does a mirror cost and how much does it save in terms of reflecting energy. These are the first calculation you have to do is a cost and scaling factor calculation. And then a lot of the, the, the wild ideas about uh, saving the climate can be abandoned. So I've talked about that and um, I'll just end by saying here's a, here's a strategy that might work which doesn't involve direct air capture uh, and simply you start with marine cloud brightening which is safe. Um, you, you do some sequestration of carbon dioxide in the ocean using some slow release method which can something like um, uh, something like kelp um, raising kelp and then letting it die and then you combine these two and um, you can what we this is in relation to the Arctic of course we, we can get from cooling and sequestration, and a small amount of restoration, we can get back to a cooler Arctic and a cooler world. This can apply to the whole world. So it can be done, but it needs, it needs a, an intensive program. It needs a lot of money and it needs political momentum, of which there isn't any. And I saw that sadly uh, in this, this year's COP, the, these bold ideas the bold initiatives which are needed at this desperate time, which our dear leader said at the beginning, this is a desperate time, we have to, to, to solve everything now. But there's been no sign at all that anything other than minor measures of the same old boring type are, are, are agreed at the end and everybody's allowed to get away with what they wanted to get away with anyway, like India with coal and um, Brazil with destroying the Amazon. It's sad, but there's no momentum for the kind of bold measures which we actually have to use, many of which involve the ocean. So I think people of who love the ocean and work with the ocean, are gonna, we're gonna have to do it all ourselves. The, the NGOs are gonna have to come up with things and put them into effect, not expect governments to do what's needed. So 
it usurps legal issues and usurps wishful thinking. And it's a moral issue. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for a brilliant talk from someone who has been at the front line of climate change and is now at the front line of ocean geoengineering. I'm very pleased to pass on to Dr. Jun Zhang, who is at the front line of ocean engineering and adding all the buffs that you say were lacking in some of the schemes. So she's going to tell us more about what she's doing there. Up to you, Jun. Okay, thank you. Can I share my uh, PowerPoint presentation? Yes, please do. Um, um, okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, let's try to start on. And slide view as well. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I will try to start. Is that okay? Mm, yes, that's okay now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Philip. And then thank you so much to uh, Professor Bodum's inspiring talk. And uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Jin Zhang from the Department of Architecture and Civil Engineering at the UNICEFAR. Uh, today, I'm going to give a, a very short presentation, I guess uh, about up to 50 minutes. Is uh, My title is uh, Our Oceans challenges, sorry, uh, challenges and then also uh, opportunities uh, from the perspective of a civil uh, engineer. So the oceans cover two thirds of the planet uh, of Earth and also play its enormous role in regulating our climate. Currently it's one third of the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere dissolves in the ocean. So you see is how critical for to, to have a healthy ocean. So oceans generate oxygen and also mitigate the climate change and also influence is the temperature and also weather pattern. Also it serves as a highway for shipping and is all very, very critical to the substances and also preservation of a human lives. But the varying effect of this climate change on the oceans may include many, many factors and not just include what has been listed on this list. The first is sea level rise, with the further disappear of the ice sheets in the polar region, and this will be accelerated, but it is clear it is rising and also it is accelerating. It's many small island countries, they may disappear but in a few years time, yeah, depending about how quickly the sea level will rise. And also other major cities are at risk and as well. And we already know is a company with the sea level rise, we are going to have more frequent storms. And in the last 21 years, in the 21st century, we already see more devastating damages from those storms as well. And also oceans climate change buffer rule is under threat. Millions of tons of carbon is currently buried and in the deep oceans muddy floor. And the latest research from the I Atlantic project has shown that this cycle is disrupted by rising ocean temperatures. And that also we, we know is a high level is uh, carbon dioxide uh, acidifying our waters as well and also destroying our ecosystems. But that is an urgent need to understand all of this ocean's response to the climate change and how that may affect future climate and also the future generations as well. So the first is a sea level rise. Observations have shown here, you can see the tables, and in the last decades, actually, the sea level rise has been more than doubled compared with the 20th century. So now we have 3.6 millimeter per year compared with only 1.4 millimeter in 20 centuries. And then also you can see some of the different in the east, the, the, the gray areas shows the uncertainty depending how many gauge we already have, how many uh, data we have. So we can reduce this uncertainty you can see in the last decade. So we have much more is better, more uh, accurate uh, predictions in terms of sea level rise. And also we know the sea level rise is you know, driven by a, a few factors and uh, is the expansion of water uh, volumes as the ocean warms and the melting is the glaciers and the melting of the ice sheets and all contribute 
to this uh, sea level rise. And future energy, uh, as Peter already mentioned, uh, even we uh, produce renewable energy, uh, probably is not fast enough, but we have to do something in particular for civil engineers. And you can see it's the UK is a climate change committee and also government have identified the need to be able to produce more renewable energy. And looking at the data, so is uh, in 1990s, we only can produce 1% UK electricity from renewables. And now by the last year, we can produce 43%. And this is a huge amount of achievement in, in just the, in the last 20, 20 years time. And then also we have the target for net zero in 2050. So it's about 80% all energy generation will be coming up from renewable. So there are a lot of uh, more actually for to do to be able to achieve this uh, level of renewable energy. So certainly is the uh, offshore and the oceans can contribute uh, a lot to this uh, future uh, renewable uh, you know, is energy generation. So in the face of uh, climate change and the next zero strategy, and uh, we have potential opportunities and solutions. So here I just list some of them. And you can see we can generate the offshore wind and then this has been very successful in the, it's currently the cost has been uh, fallen by more than 50% in recent years, and also tidal energy research, wave energy research, they may uh, come out, catch up soon, but we have much more challenges to be able to produce uh, those tidal energy and also wave energy. We also have to consider some other um, solar uh, islands that has been proposed in some of the countries. And also we might be able to work with uh, uh, hydrogen uh, is uh, uh, the sector to be able to produce hydrogen production and is green hydrogen and in offshore how to combine with uh, marine renewable energy uh, you know, is uh, forward hydrogen production and also use our existing offshore technology with the latest research and development so we can integrate and everything together and also in the face of the sea level rise and uh, some of the proposals about future floating cities and the Maldives and has a plan they need to start to, to build uh, floating cities uh, next year as well and because uh, those island countries are, are under uh, you know, is the very serious threat about losing their land and um, for the future and uh, in the face of uh, the sea level rise as well. It's a uh, my research is uh, looking at uh, um, wave structure interaction, particularly when we have more um, storms and uh, more frequent storms. And uh, so it's uh, uh, offshore wind, turbine foundation are exposed to a harsh environment. So we need to understand this wild the wave impact of offshore wind turbine foundations and those uh, haven't been fully understood and, uh, by now. So this is the research I've been uh, working on, looking at breaking wave impact on monopi is uh, on the offshore wind turbine foundation. From our research, we have found for some the wave conditions actually is a strong high order nonlinear wave loading. It takes about two thirds of the total loading. So this is uh, very different from what we understood before. Uh, in the offshore industry is a linear loading. It's easy to get, but if you can count the second or the third order, it is really, really hard. And uh, so, so those are a great uncertain area. So it's uh, from our research, we'll be able to identify is how much contribution from the higher order frequency and also particularly wave frequency and the wind frequency. So it's a kind of, you know, it's a third order wave frequency, probably that will be the same frequency as the wind loading. So if we can consider this is a high order harmonics loading, we may be able to find the, the resonance and that, and also, and how the, the vibration, the structure and the fatigue loading. And this is a, a part of my current EPSSC graph. So working with uh, Oxford and Strathclyde to, to do a small experiment, we try to produce a, a fast method and then at the end of the project, we are going to produce open source engineering tool. So hopefully this can help reduce the uncertainty in the future. And also we can drive the cost further down for offshore wind as well. So this is the one of the project we have been working on. And another project 
if we can move the, um, of the wind and to the deep water, so fixed infrastructures is not enough. So we have to make them movable as well. And the, also we need to generate is more uh, energy from wave energy, how we can work together. Is that the single platform to generate the wind? Or can we combine them together? And how we can uh, support the green hydrogen production in offshore? And also how we can protect is uh, the, the floating cities and how we can combine with the wave energy devices, with the brick water and with other infrastructure to, to make the, you know, save the space and also drive the cost down as well. Also, we have to consider the transportation of the green hydrogen and in the future. So now we come to many, many different challenges, many opportunities, we really can work together. And another research we've been working on is coastal zone uh, protection and adaptation. This is in the face of a sea level rise and how we can propose is uh, the new uh, hybrid coastal scheme and uh, how we can use hard structure and then also soft approach as well to provide a sustainable uh, future and of the coastal protection. And so those research we have been uh, working on with uh, other uh, collaborators as well. It's my colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Blankshop is working on monitoring of beaches and looking at the storm erosion and the recovery, and also looking at how we can produce a nature-based coastal protection scheme as well. Also, we can use uh, citizen science for a uh, data collection, so we, we can use those data to guide our future uh, research and also the guidance as well. So this is the research and from my uh, colleague is Dr. Anna Yang and from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Anna's research focuses on using aerospace technique to improve the performance of tidal turbines. And then also she uh, uh, developed is a new device to be able to measure uh, the unsteady flow and then try to use you know, provide that it's a better uh, loading and then to, to be able to predict the fatigue loading as well. And her, another research is the data-driven modeling. So it's a, a modeling of a tidal turbines is really cost, uh, it's expensive. How we can use this uh, uh, data-driven modeling to be able to, to reduce the, the CPU time and make them more efficient and uh, at the same order of the accuracy as well. So I have another colleague, is a Dr. Uh, Rick uh, Lovson and also from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And he is working on two different types of the research. So first there is a wind turbine simulation and the dynamics and how to estimate the motion of the floating platform and on the turbine and also on, on the other hand as well. And another research is uh, uh, Rick is working on the wider system impact of the renewable energy with your net zero decarbonization contact. And an extensive deployment of offshore renewable energy will need loads of steels and cement materials and his research and then try to find the tool to be able to mapping out modeling the system level production and the consumption of these materials as well. And also I mentioned Dr. Philip Blando, and he is the chair of today's event. And then his research is, uh, uh, he's based in the Department of Physics, and he uses acoustics to address the challenges in other disciplines. Sorry, my office. <laughs> With no funding, and then uh, Philip and his team look at the actual uh, impact tidal turbines and the wave energy converters on marine life. And I'm really delighted from his research is based on weeks and weeks of very accurate measurement. Actually, the offshore renewable energy have no adverse effects on marine life. I trust the Philip, and that is really promising to the offshore renewable energy community. So this is my uh, final slide, and I'm really fortunate uh, to be able to work with many others, and I'll be involved in many different partnerships and networking as well. Just uh, uh, ahead of the COP26, I chaired a China-UK bilateral uh, workshop on coastal protection and, uh, and the extreme weather. So this is, uh, uh, we have about over 120 participants from China and UK and uh, more than 40 institutions. I think we tackle this climate change, we really need to share, we need to age change ideas, we need to work together, a lot of challenges ahead. So if you are interested in our research, please do get in touch. Thank you.
Thank you, June, for a very interesting talk as well. And now we're open for different questions. Please use the Q&A panel to ask your questions. And the first question is about the ship contrails that Peter was uh, showing. David and Barbara Fever ask, we have possibly thousands of cruise ships traveling the world. Could the cruise liners be persuaded to go even greener that they might be doing so far and field so water spray equipment to their ships? It might make them more attractive to passengers. Peter? I'm afraid you're on mute. Okay, uh, that's a good point. And in fact, in the preliminary work to try and uh, see uh, how this um, methane removal system can work, uh, we have been starting to use a ship, uh, which is the, <laughs> and it is a sort of cruise ship, it's the uh, the ship that uh, Extreme E, the, uh, the company that does uh, uh, electric car racing uses to carry its uh, drivers around so it's a it's a ecologically viable ship and uh, so we're doing some experiments there but but yes um, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't fit the, attach this to the to the uh, funnels of, of of any ship and have a worldwide network of ships that are doing methane removal and uh, hold hold the methane down that way, stop it from having an outbreak, which seems possible at the moment. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Adrian Temple-Brown saying, Peter, great talk, thank you. If we ignore geoengineering, how many of today's billions of tons of anthropogenic CO2 do we need to draw down from our atmosphere? to return the polar ice and ocean pH to a good state? And do we need to get all the way back down to 285 ppm? Um, well, I don't think we can, e even most optimistic people don't think we can get back down to 285. I mean, one of the most optimistic people I know is uh, Sir David King with his foundation in Cambridge. But even there, they're talking about 300 and other foundations talk about 350. Really, when you're up at above 400 with all the terrible effects which we're seeing with extreme weather, then getting it down to, to, to pre-industrial levels seems a, uh, a, a dream that you'll never achieve. But getting some of the way down is, is what you hope to achieve. So maybe 350, which still means taking it still means taking more than 42 giga, gigatons out of the atmosphere per year because you need to do that just to stay in the same place. You want to do more so that you gradually bring the, the, the total, which has got a lot of fossil uh, CO2 in it bring, it, bring that down towards a lower figure. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we know what to do. We know what to aim for, but we have to be realistic about it. We have a question from Luo Feng Huang, uh, thanking both speakers for fascinating and profound presentations and wondering if, uh, Peter, you could advise on the feasibility of the Arctic ice project to improve the albedo of the sea ice surface. Um, well, there's been various proposals to do that. Um, there's a, a group in California that's spreading tiny glass beads over the surface, which I feel is, is going to be not only hideously expensive, but dangerous for when they get into the stomachs of fish. Um, and the other techniques involve um, trying to spread water over existing ice uh, and have it freeze. Uh, and that's, again, is one of those things where the, the cost is too great and the feasibility is, 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 is not good enough. You can't, you can't make enough, enough wind pumps to cover the whole Arctic. So I, I think the answer for, for trying to recover Arctic ice is actually what I, I mentioned, what I talked about, um, marine cloud brightening, because that you can focus the, the, uh, 
the drones that are pumping in, into a small region and modeling has shown that, that that will actually reduce the, the air temperature fairly significantly within, within a target region and that might bring it down enough to increase the area of sea ice. That's, that's, that's all I can think of as a, a way of bringing back some of the sea ice. Okay, well, thanks for a very detailed answer. The role of the Arctic is very important, and that's something we see regularly uh, at the Arctic Observing Summits, where we see the impacts of Arctic uh, weather systems and Arctic ice on weather systems all around the world. There is a connected question from Angus Best, asking both of you if there is a role for ocean heat pumps to remove heat and create green energy. Do you, do you want to answer first? Okay, I guess probably you have more experience on this. I, I know some research groups are uh, trying to use the, the temperature differences and uh, to be able to generate uh, the energy, but I don't know whether that could uh, lower the temperature of the ocean. My humble opinion from uh, tests that have been done, for example, in French overseas uh, departments, is that it's uh, good for creating electricity, but it wouldn't be important enough to remove the heat. Yeah, that was what I'm thinking as well. And also for Peter, I know um, you have been uh, writing and, and about the farewell to ice. I'm just, uh, I'm, just uh, I'm just wondering, do you have a time scale when we are going to say bye to those ice age in the polar uh, areas and also in the... Well, I'm uh, sorry, this is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the time scale is, you know, can, can we actually get things better at all or are things going to get worse rapidly? Um, so I don't know. Uh, the, the, there isn't any specific planning for a date. Um, although probably David King has got has got a, a date in mind, but but to achieve any date, you have to, you need a gigantic uh, engineering effort, which at the moment beyond what anybody is prepared to pay for. Um, but the the, the heat pump, uh, there's there's been some thinking about the Eastern Mediterranean there, um, some of the places I'm hanging around in at the moment that that. Uh, the, the, the water structure, you can actually get up and flow uh, through, through a vertical cylinder uh, without needing to put energy in um, if you've got the right water uh, distribution of water properties. And there's, there's, there's some places in the eastern Mediterranean which have got that. So you could just go out and put in some vertical pipes and water uh, from deep, deep water would pump itself up and spread out as a as a, some kind of um, uh, material near the surface, which would would be a nutrient. So it's, it's it, it could be very nice as a as a something con connected with with energy, uh, but not uh, not really doing anything about global heating. <laughs> not much. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Joe Bailey saying these were amazing talks. Thank you both so much. I was wondering if there have been any prototypes for the marine cloud brightening or is monitoring the ship exhaust giving enough evidence for their functioning? Well, the marine cloud brightening, I mean, uh, Stephen Salt has been ready to go for some time. And in fact, it's important that he should be given the chance to build this system because he's in his 80s now. Um, and uh, I think this is the, the best, hit, best chance we've got in, in Britain to do something really significantly to, to change, to improve the climate. Um, but the, the, uh, the ship, um, at the moment, everything rests on some laboratory experiments done this year at the University of Copenhagen. And it suggests that this method of uh, absorb of, of reacting methane with ferric chloride does actually work and so this could be the way forward it's called the iron salt aerosol method uh, and 
uh, use it, doing it from a ship would be a good way of distributing the, the aerosol around the world. Okay, so moving to an ideal world, Peter, if you had all the funding you wanted tomorrow, what would you start with? Um, I think I'd start with marine cloud brightening. That's, that's, I, I think that's really promising. It works, it's harmless, and uh, the, the models show that it, you can actually get the climate down to a lower, temp, lower, lower average temperature, which of course is impossible with reducing carbon emissions alone. You, you just warm up, but, but with this you, you can do it. So if somebody gave me uh, limitless funds, I'd, I'd put them into marine cloud brightening. Okay, and we have a last question from uh, Claudio Baghetti uh, for you as well about carbon, sorry, carbon capture storage, which is gaining acceptance even among politicians. You did not seem positive on bioenergy uh, in combination with CCS. Can you elaborate a bit more? Um, well, I really, I didn't want to go into that too much, but I had too, I, I had too many things to talk about. But um, it, it doesn't look to me as if it, it's, it's a, a great method because you start out by producing um, waste, agri waste biological material. It's like um, uh, sugar, waste sugar cane residues and so on, which is fine. You, you sort of think, well, okay, um, we're, we're getting it to do something useful. But then by, um, by, by turning that into uh, a CO2 removal method, you're, you're putting, you're, you're using a lot of energy to get a relatively small amount of, of cooling out or it, it's 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 not it's not very efficient and I'm, I'm still not sure why why it's being advocated and if you look at the look at the numbers they don't they don't look as if it's a great way of, of um, removing co2 okay thank you i don't see any other questions coming in and like another famous Frenchman uh, used to say, the clock is ticking. I'm aware that uh, we're moving past uh, uh, 1915. So I would like to thank you both, Peter and June, for your time and for these brilliant presentations this evening. Thanks also to everybody at home, in the office, in the car, wherever, for joining us today. This event will be available as a podcast and a video shortly. And it is part of a wider series on the ocean. Uh, please do visit the Institute for Policy Research website to learn more about the upcoming lectures, about working with indigenous communities, the blue economy, geopolitics of the oceans. I would personally advise reading Peter's books. They are great. Even the scientific books are enough uh, of a page turner because you want to learn more about how science is conducted on the ground. Please do look at them. You're going to enjoy them. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, Peter and June, and for everybody watching and participating in this event. Have a lovely evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.